Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Daily Friend Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and today I'm joined by Michael Morris. Michael, welcome back from holiday. It's very good to have you back on the show. Thanks very much. Good to be joining you again. And also Dr. John Endress. John, it's so very good to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. Good to be back. Right. So let's start off with, with the story, which I think is probably going to be the most interesting political story of the week, and that is the DA's march on Latuli House. Uh, they've been, as far as I can tell from their social media and campaigning stuff that uh, I've seen about in the environment, the DA's pull, pulling out all the stops to try and make this a pretty big event. Um, they say they're going to be marching to Latuli House to uh, protest um, both the electricity tariff increase, although I see President Ramaphosa, and we did talk about this yesterday, has sort of given conflicting accounts on whether he's still in favor of that or not. Um, and of course, the incredible amount of load shedding that the country has suffered from over the past few months in particular. Um, he said, uh, John Steenhazen, the DA leader, said, quote, we will specifically target Lutuli House because this is the scene of the crime that the ANC continues to perpetuate against the people of South Africa through permanent stage six load shedding. Uh, this quote was when we were in still, still in stage, stage six, but uh, we, uh, just over a week ago. And at the same time, the ANC Youth League has promised that it will um, meet the DA at Lutuli House. Uh, they firstly said the DA was using, quote, the unfortunate national crisis to score cheap political points through senseless theatrics, and that uh, they condemn the foolish conduct with the contempt it deserves. I think that's possibly one of the most overrated, uh, sorry, overused uh, <laughs> yes. phrases in ANC press releases. <laughs> but anyway, um, the ANC Youth League went on to say that should the DA continue with their planned march, they will find uh, the ANC Youth League there at Latuli House, and they will quote, peacefully lead them to ESCOM, where they must get all the answers and solutions to end load shedding. Uh, they went, went on to say that uh, the real problem is Praveen Gordon hasn't been fired, and he's the cause of load shedding, or something to that effect. So, John, let me start with you. Um, my first question to you is, what do you make of this march? Is this actually uh, something sort of useful politically, broadly speaking, do you think it might make a, an impact outside of just the, uh, the DA? Or is it just going to be just another media event? You know, what political parties do all the time to ensure that they are in the headlines. What do you think? Well, I think there's something really interesting going on there, which is that the ANC has been so adamant about bringing all levers of power under its control, uh, all state institutions. That has been very much part of its program. But it is now arriving at a point where so many of these institutions are breaking down that the ANC rather would like to distance itself somewhat from them. And uh, we saw that, I think, with the interview um, that Pule Mabe, the spokesperson for the ANC, gave, I think it was in the Sunday Times last Sunday, uh, which was just the most amazing uh, dancing around the Questions Act, uh, trying to get away from the fact that there is actually a link between the ANC and ESCOP. Um, and so when he was put on the spot and he was asked, you know, what is your position on, on, on the ANC's failure in managing to get South Africa's electricity supply right? He would say it has nothing to do with us. You must ask those questions at ESCOM. You know, that is an entirely separate matter. It has nothing to do with the ANC. And this, I, I mean, think... And, is, and even the president has sounded like he's in a position figure sometimes in the way he talks yes. about government. Exactly. And we're seeing these inherent contradictions come to the fore now in quite a beautiful way. Uh, mm -hmm. We see, you know, where the ANC was very keen to, to have the levers of power and take credit mm -hmm. for anything that worked. Now they are facing the opposite situation where they have to take the blame for things that aren't working. And that is not a very comfortable place to be. So in terms of the DA's march, I think that uh, John Steenhosen is quite right in uh, calling it the march to the scene of the crime. And it is exactly to counter this uh, thing that the ANC is trying to do at the moment, which is to distance themselves from all the things that are going wrong. Uh, and what uh, the DA and Stierno is not doing is saying, no, this is actually exactly the place where you should be. This march shouldn't be to any other place but Lutuli House, because Lutuli House is at the very center of all the dysfunctionality that we are observing in South Africa at the moment. So I think in that sense, it's quite uh, appropriate and quite correct that you do that. It's also logical for the ANC to try to divert both the physical march 
um, as the, DAU, uh, the ANC Youth League has said, as well as the attention away from the Tully House, away from the ANC, and to say, you know, this is, is something that lies completely uh, outside of our scope of action. Uh, and if you've got a problem with electricity, you must address it to ESCOM. Uh, whether that's going to work or not is another question, but I think the, the uh, underlying reasoning is sound. You do want to move the attention to where it belongs, which is with the ANC. Nicholas. I must say I'm concerned about the prospect of violence, despite the ANC Youth League's promises to peacefully lead the DA to ESCOM. Um, and I speak from some personal experience back in 2012. I was a DA activist and I marched with the DA to Kasatu House in favor of the youth wage subsidy. And we were met there by Kasatu throwing bricks um, and using tailor, tasers and things. In fact, there's still some quite amazing photos from that day because a street battle ensued where everyone was throwing things at each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was a year or two later, the DA marched to Latuli House, but never made it there because a large group of ANC supporters blocked the way and it became extremely tense and violent and the police basically told the DA, you're not allowed to go there because it'll just be carnage. Uh, and even so, I think there was still some minor violence that carried on. Coupled to this, you've got sort of lone lunatics on social media saying things like, oh, you know, the last time someone tried to march to the ANC's headquarters, I think was Shell House where a massacre ensued. The IFP, I think, tried to march past. Mm. It was it, it's back in the 90s, yeah. Mm. Um, so, I don't know, Michael, what do, you, what do you make firstly of the likelihood of some kind of violence? And secondly, the political consequences of such a thing? I mean, in a sort of weird way, it might even be good for the DA to have people mm. around at them. Yeah, um, it is a, a sort of perverse um, thing, isn't it? I mean, the, the risk, I, I think, always in South Africa is that our politics becomes violent. It, it, the, the, the impulse to, to that always seems to be just below the surface. But I think the, the, the risk becomes that we, you know, we don't exercise our political rights because we're anxious that somebody might misbehave. And I think it's important for us to, as South Africans, as political parties, to, to get out there and exercise these rights of protest, rights of, as John says, to bring the attention to bear where it actually belongs. Um, I think that I think that is important, um, and in you know in terms of the consequences, uh, I think that uh, the, the DA quite clearly, I, I would imagine, will have marshals will be monitoring the situation very carefully, will be making decisions as things happen, um, and one certainly doesn't want to see any any violence or bloodshed on on any side. Um, but but should there be any difficulties in in the DA? exercising what is really a very ordinary democratic right, um, I think the the credit will redound uh, to them. Um, so wh whoever in the ANC is strategizing around this uh, ought to think carefully about about how they respond. Um, it, and I, I absolutely agree with John that, it, you know, it, it's not helping them at all, I don't think, to, to be seen to be deflecting attention from uh, circumstances where they kind of insisted on being in charge, having the state control everything. Uh, every kind of policy is is uh, is is kind of heavy-handed and and centrally directed. Um, yeah, and I, I think you uh, said Nicholas that I mean even Ramaphosa. Um, I think yesterday was saying, you know, uh, we, we, we when we are supposed to do things, there is this regulation, law, and processes. When Eskom has to buy a boiler, they have to go to the treasury and get permission. It's a long process. Well, <laughs> it's it, they are the government who are designing these. Uh, regulations and processes. It is proper and, uh, that there should be uh, uh, open and, and accountable uh, processes, but uh, we we know that the ANC's intrusions are excessive um, and and burdensome uh, and have actually created the problems that we now face. So, John, last question to you. You know, I can envision a scenario where. Um, we get closer to the elections in 2024 and the ANC pulls out all the stops to ensure that ESCOM is in the best state that it can be in a short period of time. And we go down to sort of, I don't know, stage two load shedding. And everyone has either made a plan to get around ESCOM or alternatively, um, you know, they're so relieved by the situation easing that it's kind of 
almost becomes a bit of a flat issue that no one cares anymore. Do you think anything like that is likely? And what are your final thoughts on this topic? Mm, absolutely. So I think it would be really uh, smart on the part of the ANC to plan for and construct a story of redemption. Uh, and the way to do that would be to let load shedding get really bad this year. Uh, you know, make sure that people are up in arms, marching on a Thule house, mm. showing how fed up they are. Uh, and then by January next year, uh, pulling out all the stops, as you say, to make sure that load shedding drops a few stages to prove that the ANC is able to turn the situation around. It's got everything under control. It can be forgiven. It can be given another chance. Uh, and that I think would be a very successful strategy. And I think it is one that the ANC is working on. If you look at Guido Mantashe's comments that uh, we can uh, resolve load shedding within six to 12 months, if we pay attention to it, uh, and Inokurawana saying 12 to 18 months. The kind of turnaround you're going to get there, however, is not going to be a good turnaround. It's going to be the kind of turnaround where you, you, know, you just spend lots of money on diesel, make sure you don't run out of money on that. Uh, you get the car power ships, you know, floating power platforms in at no matter, no matter the cost. Uh, you maybe deploy some security forces to make sure there's no sabotage. And you just keep that up for six months from January to whenever the elections happen in 2024 to be able to say to the people of South Africa, look, last year was really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a consequence of many years of failure, but we've turned things around. You can trust us. Vote for us. That would be a great story for the ANC. Nick. Mm, something to watch out for. Anyway, I'm curious mm. to see how this unfolds politically, whether they'll get any hay from it. Um, or whether other opposition parties will also be able to perhaps um, do something similar. Okay, let's move on to our uh, next story. And this is more a collection of things that we've you know just been seeing in the news, which is the incredible uh, devastation um, that load shedding seems to be uh, wreaking on the, 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 uh, uh, the small business sector in particular. Um, there's calls now, I think, by the National Small Business Chamber who are the largest represent, uh, representative group for small and medium enterprises in the country, um, saying that uh, if load shedding goes on for another two years, they're really not going to be able to, to, to hang on, and therefore they need a diesel subsidy or some sort of financial aid from government to ensure that uh, they can uh, keep themselves going through periods of load shedding. There's also some information out from Stats SA that businesses are really um, suffering at the moment, not just from, from load shedding, but also from uh, the kind of global pressures to do with uh, high inflation and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and then there was an opinion piece written recently uh, by Neva Maketla, who said that um, there's basically no way in which the economy will grow unless the electricity crisis is solved. Um, so, Michael, I kind of, there's an interesting question here, which is, are we doomed to no economic growth? Because if, or, or you know, anemic, like I'm sort of talking 1% or less. Because we know in our analysis, or at least we predict in our analysis, that fixing ESCOM is not going to happen probably anytime soon, not for many years. And there may be ups and downs, but generally speaking, the situation is going to be pretty bad. But the sort of indications we're getting both from the stats and from the opinion pages uh, and analysts beyond just ourselves is that... Um, you can't grow the economy without electricity. So are we just sort of stuffed? What do, you, what do you think? Do you think people make plans to get around this? I think people try to. Um, and, I, you know, if, if I have um, optimism about South Africa, and I do, generally speaking, it's, it's that I have absolute faith in ordinary people finding solutions on their own, and particularly in the private sector in being... Uh, quite agile, very energetic, very imaginative, and has unfortunately lots of lots of experience doing so because it's, that's those are the conditions we, we live with. And I think I've lived with for a long time. Um, so I think generally we tend to be a, a fairly um, robust and resilient, I mean, we're tired of, in, in a way, of, tired of hearing these words, but we, I think that that is very true. Um, but the, the burden is undoubtedly growing. I, just at the weekend, uh, our colleague, Maurice Root, was, was working in Cape Town and uh, we went out to Simon's Town at lunchtime. We, we, we haven't, I haven't met up with him for a while in the Cape. And um, I had in mind a, a favorite uh, fish and chips place in Simon's Town, right on the, on the harbor front. But we arrived just as load shedding began, peered through the door, and there was a staff of probably about six saying, sorry, 
uh, you're going to have to come back in two hours' time because you know we we don't have the facilities. And there were other places that were, were managing bigger outfits um, who presumably had generators or had some means of of of, uh, of keeping on keeping going. But this just brought home to me um, that it just takes a little bit of exposure, a little bit of vulnerability, to place you know six breadwinners at risk. Place that business uh, under pressure on a you know a lunchtime at a weekend, your prime sort of operating time, and just summarily shut down because of uh, the poorly run uh, electricity generator. So, yeah, I think the I think the burden is immense. We see it all over the place. We ha I, I was chatting to somebody just the other day who has a picture hanging service, and they generally rely on charging um, portable drills and things, so they they don't need to plug in. Their, their tools but they need them to be charged and he said you know it's, it's fine if you go from one area to your next job in another area where the, there isn't load shedding but if you have two lots, lots of load shedding in, in sort of adjacent uh, slots in your working day your tools run out and then you, you start it you, you know you're stuck for another two hours you lose business the costs aren't met and so on so I mean from a business point of view especially if you're a small business and you know, trying to keep paying salaries for a few people um, and pay your own bills, which are mounting, it must be really, really difficult and depressing, I would imagine. Very, very trying. Yeah, it's not a good sign when battery operated businesses are, <laughs> are having so yeah. much lunch and they can't go on. Yeah. Um, mm. So, John, sort of same question to you as to whether A, we're stuck in this, but B, you know, looking towards the solutions and, you know, I do like to always have something about the solutions. Let's say 2024, a new government comes over, which is very focused on actually solving the problem of ESCOM, or at least the problem of electricity. Let's separate that from the problem of ESCOM because they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, what could they do immediately to start improving the situation? Hmm. Well, I, th I think uh, there probably aren't really quick fixes, um, but there are slower and faster solutions and obviously want to get onto the track of the faster solutions. Um, and the reason this matters is because it's easy to think that load shedding is a kind of linear challenge. In other words, stage four load shedding is twice as bad as stage two and stage six is three times as bad as stage two. But it turns out that that's actually not true. Um, so this is not something that gets linearly worse as, as the stages go up, um, but rather you get step changes or you get exponential uh, increases in the, the, the range of the challenges that you face. And Michael's example is a good one, um, where you say, for example, at stage two load shedding, uh, a business can still operate because it can charge its batteries in between the bouts of load shedding. At stage three, it can still do that. At stage four, maybe it can't do that anymore. Or at stage six. Mm -hmm. So as these stages go up, more and more components of the economy start dropping out of the equation uh, and, and, and create follow-on problems uh, all the way through the value chains. That is why the high stages of load shedding are so, so threatening. Another way in which the system is not linear um, is represented by the irrigation farmers uh, who've been complaining to the president mm. with good cause and saying that they wouldn't be able to harvest if they can't uh, irrigate their crops. And for them, you know, load shedding during the winter months might be okay, but there are certain times of the year we've got to make sure that your crops are well irrigated, otherwise you're not going to harvest anything. That's not a linear thing. You know, that's something you need to sort of factor in as you, as you think about load shedding. Uh, and I think that this this thinking doesn't seem to have really uh, penetrated into the echelons of of our decision makers, unfortunately. Uh, and that is going to that is going to be a very risk, big risk for the country that we don't recognize that stage six is is many many orders of magnitude more dangerous than stage two load shedding, even though it seems quite close in terms of the numbers. Um, to answer your question, what what should one do if, if if you wanted to fix the situation quickly? I think you need the private sector in there, but you also need the rules of the game to be such that it allows for the problem to be solved. Yeah. And at the moment, there are three obstacles in the way of a solution, uh, which are the following. The first one is that ESCOM has no freedom in its staffing decisions. It cannot decide who to hire, who to fire. It is subject to transformation imperatives, uh, to representativity requirements. Uh, to local foreign, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, numbers balancing, uh, all sorts yeah. of things, cater deployment. Um, so it can't choose who it hires freely. 
Um, and that means it can't get the right people. It, it's overstaffed. It can't get rid of the wrong people. And that is all slowing everything down. It, it hasn't got the right competences uh, throughout the organization that it needs. The second barrier is procurement. Um, ESCOM doesn't have freedom in, procure, uh, freedom in procurement. It is subject to preferential procurement guidelines. It needs to buy from uh, small back suppliers at a certain number. It's got localization requirements. It's got local content requirements, et cetera, et cetera. It can't control what it's buying. It cannot buy for value for money exclusively, which is what it should be doing. And that also allows for the introduction of those corrupt elements into the supply chains. The third thing is law enforcement. So we now very clearly know, and I think you've seen it in the, the chat and the comments, people mentioning uh, the involvement of politicians in corrupt supply chains. I think that is pretty much a certainty that that is the case. And as long as you can't remove that corruption, that theft, that sabotage out of the production of electricity, you can't fix the problem. So those three things need to be addressed. And I think while the ANC is in power, they cannot be addressed because they are so intrinsically linked to the very purpose of the party and its ideology. Uh, and unfortunately, what that means, I think, is that as long as the ANC is in power, load shedding is going to be around. Nick? Mm, definitely. No, those are, I think, you could do, you could change those rules pretty much close to day one. And it would at least start to improve the situation. And like you say, if we were at least at stage two and never went higher than that, um, the situation would be vastly superior. Michael, any final thoughts on this before we move on? Hmm. I, I was just thinking of, of a story that I saw the other day. Uh, I know we're going to be talking about Jordan Hill, Hill Lewis in a moment, I think, but it was about Cape Town and its determination to you know, deliberately bring in as many uh, strategies and so on that, as they could have, even at this stage to try and relieve the um, the dependence on uh, the city's dependence on 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 ESCOM. Um, so I think there are probably lots of different things uh, that can be done. Maybe they piecemeal, they're not quite big enough really to tackle the national scale of things. But um, but yeah, I, I, you know I think so long as there are clever people focusing on solutions, that's a good thing. All right, so let's move on to um, the topic of federalism. Um, I think it's very clear that federalism is only going to become a more and more uh, uh, prevalent topic in our politics because uh, regardless of what happens at the national level i would uh, bet a comfortable amount of money that the ANC is probably going to lose at least two if not three provinces um, in the next election so it'll be the western cave of course but also the ANC is under severe threat in kzn where a resurgent IFP looks like they could take them out. And the Kharteng, where a coalition of the DA and Action SA and a number of other parties may come together to knock them out of the provincial government. And we're already, I think, seeing some of the early battle lines about what, prov what provinces and what metros can do being drawn uh, across the country. So there's um, President Ramaphosa, saying that uh, he's very concerned about the misspending of money by provinces and that uh, he's expressed a desire to appoint a budget director who would monitor the budgets which treasury allocated to provinces i mean one would think that treasury is supposed to monitor that but anyway um he was speaking to a, a provincial executive committee meeting in kzn on monday and uh he said and now i want to have someone in my office who will just be monitoring budget spending in in, uh, in other countries um, people have them. President Obama of America had a budget director and that uh, he was so concerned about the misallocation of resources in provinces that it, that he described it as a crime against humanity when money for services was allocated but not used to improve service delivery. Um, at the same time, while the president seeks to perhaps tighten his direct control over uh, what the provinces are being given by Treasury, Jordan Hill Lewis, the mayor of Cape Town, has said that he is being ignored by national government with regards to the rail systems within the municipality. So according to Jordan Hill Lewis, the cabinet made a decision in early 2022 where competent municipalities would have their uh, the rail services in the area basically handed to them so that they could run them. Uh, this would help out PRASA, which is the Passenger Rail Association of South Africa. Uh, he, John Hill Lewis claimed, however, that despite trying to get this enacted, um, he's simply been ignored by Transport mm -hmm. Minister Fikile Mbalula. 
and that they were brought, uh, lodged a request in May of last year, but that nothing has come through. Um, and uh, he says that there is a scheme afoot in the background uh, by some members of cabinet to do a U-turn on the earlier decision. So John, um, two things. Firstly, you know, it, I think it's one thing to say, no, we're not going to devolve the power. <laughs> And it's another thing to just kind of ignore you. Um, the, the second one is way more dysfunctional. But secondly, do you agree with my, my framing of this, that federalism will become a hotter topic going forward? I think it will. Uh, and the reason for that is that it is a, a severe threat to the ANC. Um, you know, I think if you look back 20 years, the ANC was pretty much in control everywhere. Uh, life was good. Life was easy. Life was comfortable. But the DA has built a bit of a beachhead in the Western Cape. Uh, it is proving to be far more capable at service delivery, at job creation, all the good, th good things that residents and citizens want. Uh, and the ANC is seeing that with some discomfort. Uh, and so I think when they see a competent administration wanting to expand its power and its scope for showing how competent it is, it is going to be very uncomfortable with that. And that may be why uh, uh, an answer has not been forthcoming from the president's office on uh, Jordan Hill Lewis's request to be allowed to take over the process services. Um, but ultimately, I think that is the, the way things are, are heading. Um, we get the impression that the central government is in many ways quite feeble uh, and uh, a non-response seems to be the best they can marshal at the moment. Nick. So there's this, this interesting uh, dynamic where I think a lot of people in the ANC, Michael, have been very scared of federalism, not just for ideological reasons, although there definitely is that. The ANC has a very, very strong streak <clears throat> of centralizing power. And I'm sure there's going to be efforts to do that if they remain in government after 2024. But um, there are also some arguments perhaps one can make against federalism. You look at a place like uh, Limpopo, which I think has to be placed under administration by the national government because it was so badly run. Um, there have been various municipalities across the country which have just, I think of... Uh, Maluti Apufong, the area, the municipality around um, Harry Smith, which pretty much collapsed and then got taken over by a weird opposition coalition, mostly headed by a local party, and is still sort of collapsed, um, unable to provide basic services. What do you say to 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 the argument that some in the ANC might say, but saying, "Oh no, if we give the provinces more power, then Mpumalanga will be even more corrupt than it already is." Hmm. I'm not really sure. I mean, I hadn't really thought of the thought of that particular angle. But I think if you know, certainly if if, if one looks at provinces that are capable, and, and that was really Hill Lewis's argument, you know, give the powers to capable provinces. Um, I think I think he said competent municipalities was his exact phrase. Right, right, um, and uh, you know. We, we, we essentially we here in the Western Cape we're talking about the lives of of, of hundreds of thousands of commuters, um, who you know we, we, which would be massively improved if the, the once very successful train service um, could be resuscitated, um, and uh, you know I, I think people would would the ordinary people voters would 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 get uh, increasingly frustrated at the. It's at witnessing an, an argument about uh, the risk of, of things not working in Mpumalanga if the, the opportunity to actually get them working uh, where there are competent authorities uh, is turned down um, on, on, on that basis. Um, and certainly here in the Western Cape, I think the rail service, even the ports, uh, are the, the kinds of things that, um, that, that the administration here could run much better. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and there's a national interest actually, I think, in in in, in doing these things. And definitely speaking, it would be nice to have South Africa's ports functioning properly again, because I know the Durban mm. port in particular is having a rough time, um, despite being a very big port. Um, John, just very briefly as a final note, same question to you about uh, the you know the counter argument that federalism is not a great idea. Well, it's there's a risk in it. Um, but I think it is the risk that goes inherent with freedom. You know, freedom to experiment, mm. freedom to vary, freedom to try things out. Sometimes it's going to work out, sometimes it's not. Uh, but ultimately, you want to find out what does work and what doesn't. You want the competition between different provinces. You want people to be able to move where things are working. You want people to take their resources to the working provinces 
that's how it's meant to work. You know, you don't want a central government that thinks it can figure out but really can't, uh, which Ooh. is what we've got at the moment. Nick. I just see uh, right. uh, Whiskey Jack's yeah. point about, um, you know, that we, we, we shouldn't be working with enclaves and, and uh, you know, quasi-apartheid things. I don't think that's the issue. I mean, I think the issue is that the, the DA is demonstrating what it can actually do in the Western Cape, and that is a model that the country can follow. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I have no sense here in the Western Cape of people wanting to uh, return to some kind of apartheid uh, nirvana or some kind of ideal from the past. It's, it's simply not so. Um, the city is is, is modern and, uh, and and forward looking. It's uh, loads of people coming from all over the country because it's a good place to live, and it's not just white people. It's not a race thing. Um, I see that in our own street. So it's it really is an opportunity to do what works. I think that that that's that's the you know we've we've come down to a pretty gritty sort of place now. I think. Indeed. All right. That is all the time we have for today. I hope that you found the show interesting and we will be back tomorrow on the Daily French Show. Cheers, everyone.